Hello everyone, welcome to this uh, third lecture in the series of this introduction to remote sensing. And uh, in this particular uh, lecture we will be discussing different platforms of remote sensing in much more detail. I have already introduced, so wherever we find uh, some overlap uh, we will skip and otherwise we will go in detail about these platforms. As we have also seen this uh, that uh, there is an energy source, then there is a earth surface or objects, then energy source and uh, the sun is there, then satellite is there and uh, so on so forth. Uh, the main which we are going to discuss about the uh, different satellites. As you know that uh, remote sensing, for remote sensing like for by human, you need not to go in a space even on remaining on ground that can be done. So, there is a ground based remote sensing is there, then the remote sensing can be airborne remote sensing, uh, remote sensing can be through the shuttle missions and uh, remote sensing can be space borne or through the satellites as well. So, they so far uh, from ground to space we have reached, but uh, maybe in future we might be having some other types of remote sensing that is why I have not. Uh, uh, you know exhausted this list and on the same time we also had a, a not really a ground based but airborne through balloons in the history as, as well even today some people resort to that. Most popular one nowadays is uh, through UABs and drones which is being done even in nowadays in this country in the marriages or some cultural functions people have started using these drones or UAVs putting video cameras getting live transmission from these uh, UAVs based uh, cameras to the uh, to the earth and then uh, same time it is being broadcasted as well. So, this has become very very popular in recent years through helicopters or uh, aircrafts can also be done uh, which is uh, in uh, near earth orbit quite close to in just uh, maybe 1 kilometer or 2 kilometer depending on the terrain and that can also be done almost live and uh, many in US you in many hot pursuits and other things people are using helicopters for that. So, that kind of remote sensing is also be done and then of course, through aeroplanes it is being done can be done and then ultimately which we are here in the satellites. So, that is uh, continuously being done this kind of remote sensing. So, satellite based remote sensing having several advantages and it is being done regularly. So, first we will start with ground based, there are different methods are available. Nowadays people use some mobile hydraulic platforms which can go up to 15 meter, 20 meter and uh, then uh, remote sensing can be done for some uh, crop related studies or some and uh, disaster related studies. Ground based platforms uh, can be some uh, temporary platforms or can be some permanent platforms like uh, here the towers can be installed with uh, greater rigidity than mast and uh, this mast uh, can then provide a, it can have some sensors at different uh, heights and can provide the data maybe the temperature, maybe the wind speed, maybe the precipitation and uh, wind direction and so on so forth that is also a uh, some kind of remote sensing and unstable uh, these uh, temporary uh, uh, portable masts are not that stable. So, depending on the application people go for these ground based studies. Then uh, there are weather uh, surveillance radars especially in the airports or where the weather is having a lot of uh, dynam uh, where weather is dynamic people go for this kind of uh, systems detects tracks typhoons cloud masses and uh, India is also considering these weather surveillance radars in case of cloud bust especially in Himalayan terrain. So, that kind of ground based platforms are also being used extensively depending on the application. Then airborne platforms may be balloon based which a uh, height may not be much, but uh, say ab up to 40 meter and tool to probing atmosphere, lower atmosphere which is really very close like uh, uh, 
the fog phenomena or a smog or uh, you know pollution which is very close to the earth can be uh, sensed by these sensors on board of these balloons and they may be man made or um, man manned balloon, uh, balloon or may be unmanned even and useful to test instruments under development that is also being used when uh, before you go for space born uh, uavs as i have mentioned have become very very popular and uh, these are completely unmanned uh, vehicles where you can put the normal cam cameras and take the photographs as uh, shown here in the series or you can put the video cameras and uh, take pictures change the height uh, through remote controls and uh, can record the things so these are have become very very popular in case of natural disasters or uh, even uh, you know different types of constructions in civil engineering and so on and so forth so these have these are quite stable and very nowadays very cost effective uh, so these are being used extensively and wherever very high resolution data is required and uh, for a small area data is required then uav can be employed people are have also started now employing these uavs for underwater studies as well but uh, that's a different kind of remote sensing then aircraft uh, has already been there that uh, what are the, uh, the there are certain advantages with aircraft especially the higher spatial resolution it can provide very high spatial resolution data uh, but uh, generally it is uh, having a analog photography or uh, digital photography can also be done but the generally these are the snapshots so one has to remember uh, that uh, that uh, a sort of disadvantage easily change their schedule to avoid weather problems if there are clouds or fog conditions you may not acquire the data at that time so uh, but with the satellites you cannot change so that is the advantage of the aircraft and sensor maintenance and repair is easy because the aircraft will go collect the data and come back and later on everything can be done on the ground whereas in case of satellite once it is launched it is launched nobody can go there and repair except from ground you can do some maneuvering uh, of the sensors but not to much extent and where are there some certain disadvantages with the aircraft airborne uh, remote sensing platforms uh, sometimes you have to acquire permissions from neighboring countries or foreign countries uh, to fly these aircrafts many passes to cover a large area because of high spatial resolution you require many sorties to cover a even a small area suppose a large mine is there a mining area is there then might be many sorties are required or for certain explorations of water or flooding that requires swath is much less compared to the satellites because satellite far deeper in space can cover a large area that is why we used word synoptic view which satellite data can provide aircraft cannot provide that kind of synoptic view so swath is much less in case of aircraft and the cost uh, per unit area is much more in case of aircraft than satellite data space borne platforms uh, and the remote sensing the satellite remote sensing or satellite based remote sensing is nowadays the most popular one many many countries are having their own satellites including india so sensors are mounted on board a spacecraft and these are launched by certain vehicles Uh, or maybe rocket satellites or even space shuttles have also been uh, used for different kind of uh, uh, data collections and uh, there are various advantages as uh, in case of satellite data synoptic view that means it covers a very large part of the earth in just one go depending of course nowadays on resolution then the repetitivity of the area is uh, very much possible in case of aircraft every time it has to fly the same area almost in the same manner may not be possible but in case of satellite once it put in a appropriate orbit it will keep acquiring the data till it's uh, stay in the space so that is the very, very big advantage with the spacecraft now there are different types of orbits are there and uh, we we are familiar with a few orbits and uh, we will go in detail little bit on that that uh, the the normal remote sensing is being done through the 
and sensors which are put in sun synchronous orbits which are around 840 kilometer and uh, away from the earth in space and uh, which are near polar orbit and uh, there are them uh, some other orbits like geostationary orbits which are a far deeper maybe 36 uh, uh, thousand kilometer away uh, 3600 kilometer away from uh, earth and uh, they keep looking the uh, same part of the earth all the time. So, uh, as the earth moves the satellite moves that is why they are called geostationary and uh, or uh, some satellites like GPS satellites they are called geosynchronous orbits. So, there are three main types of orbits one is polar orbiting orbit or sun synchronous, another one is geostationary, another one is geosynchronous. Here are two types of orbits which are popular and uh, uh, apart from GPS which is not here and uh, that the uh, geostationary orbits. Uh, so, like uh, uh, communication satellites which are now uh, nowadays also having uh, capabilities to acquire the images of the same part of the earth on a regular basis maybe uh, every half an hour you can have a snapshot a satellite over sitting over India like say INSET or Kalpana series of satellite can provide the snapshot of India and surroundings after every half an hour. So, that is the biggest advantage with geostationary satellites. So, repeatability uh, can be enhanced to whatever the requirements are there and uh, uh, whereas polar orbiting satellite they are having fixed orbit and uh, below these orbit the earth rotates. So, the repeatability is not in our hands as per the design of the orbit and they are near polar orbiting satellite means not exactly from north to south, but having a roughly 9 degree inclination they keep orbiting the earth. So, there are two main and this is the polar orbiting or near polar orbiting or sun synchronous satellites. These are the satellites. Uh, in which uh, the remote sensing sensors are there and the most of the remote sensing which we uh, are going to discuss or have been discussing is mainly about this near polar orbiting sun. Why it is called sun synchronous? Because local whenever it will pass over an area of the earth, the local time would be is going to be the same. Suppose a satellite is designed to overpass say over Roorkee at 9.30 every day whenever it visits. So, whenever it will visit it will overpass local time 9.30. So, that is why it is it has been synchronized with the uh, sun and uh, uh, so that uh, with that kind of timing. So, when we compare one image of say uh, 1980 and then 1990 we know that the, uh, the sun conditions of if it is season is same then sun conditions might be the same as well because the time is same. So, this this is the another advantage of having sun synchronous satellites. NOAA series of satellites are also polar orbiting near polar orbiting satellites and set series meteosat in Kalpana all these are the geostationary satellites. They are different in orbit different in depth and so on and so forth. So, this is what is as earth rotates and these satellites also rotate in the orbit and keep looking the same same part of the earth every time. So, that is why they are stationary relatively they are stationary with the earth and whereas these uh, these satellites are, uh, are uh, near polar orbiting satellites earth rotates and uh, these keep orbiting the earth and uh, this yellow part is the swath or the coverage of the uh, on the part of the earth that uh, strip which is going to cover by these satellite. So, the orbits are different their purpose are different and therefore, um, their applications are also different. Third type of orbits are the uh, geo, uh, geosynchronous or GPS satellites which is which are having distance very very far 20,200 kilometer and uh, they uh, the GPS of course, is a American system. India is now also having our own navigation system. So, this American system is having uh, uh, you know uh, different orbits basically there are uh, uh, 6 orbital planes and in total in each orbit you are having 4 satellites in total you are having 24 satellites uh, uh, you know orbiting the earth uh, at different inclinations at uh, 20,200 kilometer and uh, this is sky plots basically shows uh, that uh, the data navigation 
data from different types of navigation systems. Uh, blue dots are or blue circles are showing from GPS, then GLONASS, Galileo, this is QZSS is Japanese system, then Baidu which is Chinese system and IR and SS. So, a, having a simple uh, receiver if it is capable of receiving signals in different frequencies, then it can nowadays it is possible to get uh, signals from at least 3, 4 navigation systems and your positional accuracy improves uh, very highly. So, you can get you know few centimeter uh, accuracy in terms of your horizontal position. Uh, the GPS satellites, uh, there are number of uh, satellites as mentioned 24, then GLONASS are is also a global system. So, it is having a Russian system, it is also having 24 satellites. Uh, Galileo uh, is a regional system mainly focused for Europe, but they are having planned, uh, they are having 30 satellites. Whereas, a uh, Japanese uh, is purely a very regional system, so they are having one satellite. Baidu is a global system, they are having 35 uh, satellites planned. In India, this IRNSS or NAVIC is also a, re, a regional system. So, we have planned for 7 satellites and 3 are in geostationary orbit and, uh, and 4 are in geostationary orbit at different locations and uh, some are having a different location. So, uh, different countries as per their requirements and uh, not having dependency on American system have developed their own navigation systems like India, China, Russia, Japan and other countries are there. So, uh, various earth observer, uh, observing satellites especially in passive region that is the passive rem uh, remote sensing region and the very popular one is still continuing since 70s is uh, NOAA UHRR and uh, then uh, we, we are having Landsat a complete series there NOAA 19 is uh, currently in orbit also 18 data can be acquired from NOAA 18 and 19. Uh, Landsat 8 is in operational, uh, SPOT uh, is there, IRS uh, they were they served the purpose, now they are not there, but the CARTO set, resource set, ICONOS was a private uh, uh, satellite uh, launched by American company which provided data at 1 meter resolution, very high resolution data of that time. Then there are some other satellites like sea waves, GOES, METEO set, these are mainly uh, many like Meteosat is a geostationary satellite and then another very popular series which is still there in space providing lot of good data sets is coming from this Terra earth observing satellites uh, uh, especially um, it is having MODIS sensor on two, uh, two uh, satellites uh, Terra and Aqua then you are having Aster satellite you are having other various satellites are available which are mainly in near polar orbit, sun synchronous orbit and uh, providing data at different resolutions. Now, if we look uh, instead of passive now look for the active remote sensing and not as many as passive, but there are few satellites. So, it's this series basically the active remote sensing or space borne uh, remote sensing started with uh, European Space Agency by the satellite ERS. It served this purpose for some years, then NVSAT came and that is also not functional, but the new series in this one, the Sentinel one, uh, which is working and uh, providing good uh, remote uh, active remote sensing or microwave data and especially uh, this is equipped with SAR interferometry. So, it can provide data in pair and uh, the another very good advantage, the data is free. So, it can be utilized extensively for many applications, especially applications where one is looking for changes on the surface of the earth, maybe changes induced by an earthquake, maybe land subsidence, maybe landslides and uh, in, even in the flood conditions because uh, microwave region the clouds cannot create any problem and therefore, you get a clean picture. So, radar remote sensing has got its own applications. Uh, earlier the Canada also had its own radar active remote sensing satellite which was named as radar set. 
India has also our own satellite RISAT, but uh, it is not having SAR interferometry capabilities, but still it is quite useful. Then you are having Japanese satellites, ALOS, Pulsar. Uh, Pulsar is a sensor which is having a SAR interferometry capabilities, is still in operation, and uh, many more satellites might be coming in this one. But the most popular one nowadays is the Sentinel because data is free and then allows of course it cost lot but is still the data is being used by uh, for uh, this uh, different purposes. Uh, this slide I have already covered in the previous lecture uh, which gives you the in glimpse uh, about the history of uh, your lens set. So, it is started in 1972 still it is continuing lens set 8 was launched in February 2013 there have been overlaps there might be uh, they, this uh, may continue for long time then in 2020 uh, lens set 9 has been planned. Lens set has really changed the remote sensing scenario of the world. Our own uh, uh, India has also made lot of contribution in case of remote sensing especially in passive remote sensing through IRS series then uh, resource set series then IRS P series, Carto set series and so on so forth. There are few things which are mentioned I would like to go in detail in here that like IRS 1A and BIN V uh, they, uh, they had uh, this uh, altitude means distance from the earth was 904 kilometers, 904 kilometer. The local uh, the equator crossing time was 1030 local uh, crossing time might be different adjacent orbits uh, and there were just one day difference the repeatability that means the temporal resolution was 22 days but if you are having two satellites in tandem this can be reduced to half means 11 and it was possible with irs 1a and 1b for a few years this uh, irs 1a 1b had the two sensors list 1 and list 2 later on irs 1c 1d had the three sensors pen VIF sensor and then LIST3 sensors. List, list 3 was in that was the having 23.5 uh, meter resolution and uh, there is a, a, you know it provided qu good quality of data. The orbit was little lower and uh, there are two in the series IRS 1C and 1D they lasted for 5 years. Then came resource set. So, it had a, a new sensor list 4 it continued with list 3 and uh, advanced uh, WIF uh, sensor was also there and then Carto set mainly for Carto set was mainly for uh, you know this stereo data to in order to prepare a high resolution digital elevation model. So, that had uh, about uh, 4 meter resolution. So, likewise uh, or 2.8 meter resolution data was provided through these uh, Indian systems. Now, this uh, lens set uh, had uh, uh, two sensors initially and uh, they were uh, this uh, RBB sensor and uh, it has a uh, visible and uh, then uh, all three channels were visible in different parts of visible part of EMS spectrum, multispectral were there some infrared near infrared channels were there visible were also there and uh, the systems which we had developed uh, had a uh, uh, different resolutions here. Later on the latest in this series the Landsat 8 or which is also called OLI series is having uh, many sensors. Some sensors are providing data at 30 meter resolution, some sensor some bands are providing data at 15 meter resolutions. And uh, so, depending on the requirements and capabilities of the sensors different spatial resolution from the same platform data is being available now. This data is also free. Landsat data uh, 1, 2, 3 all these were uh, costing lot of money, but uh, now Landsat 8 data is free and uh, almost in near real time you can get the images uh, through net at your desktop. So, that is the biggest advantage with Landsat 8. IRS 1A mission uh, which was uh, there and uh, we have already covered this part. So, going to skip, but just to compare these two sensors which became very popular and changed the Indian remote sensing and the list 1 and list 3 
resolution has 72.5, list uh, list 2 having 36.25 and then swath uh, was very wide here, but here because of higher spatial resolution it became uh, less and then the repetitivity of course by the same and it had almost same channels, uh, same bands uh, were there even list 1 and list 2, but uh, at two different resolutions. So, that was the biggest advantage. Carto said of course, the resolution as you can see is uh, uh, you know spatial resolution 65 centimeter the latest in the series Carto set 2 uh, which provided the data earlier was uh, little different and then uh, uh, you know the swath is very less. See this thing one has to understand the when you increase the spatial resolution of a satellite or a sensor the swath will reduce. So, there is a reverse relation higher the spatial resolution less the swath means the ground coverage the strip which is going to cover is going to be very less. So, let me give you the comparison like NOAA VHRR which is having swath of about uh, uh, 3600 kilometer, but sorry 2800 kilometer, but the spatial resolution is 1.1 kilometer that means 1100 meters. In case of uh, uh, Carto set the swath width from 2800 kilometer has been reduced to 9.6 kilometer and whereas the spatial resolution is 0.65 meters. So, you if you improve the spatial resolution of a sensor then the swath bit will reduce and that means the repetitivity will also reduce because then uh, is today if it has covered a very small uh, width of the earth or a swath a uh, 9.6 kilometer wide uh, strip of the earth then it, it will uh, take lot of long time to come back again and cover the same part of the earth. So, a high spatial resolution will, uh, will create a few problems for particularly about the narrow swath and more uh, you know poor temporal resolution. The re repetitivity will reduce drastically. So, these things have to be this is a kind of trade off higher spatial resolution less swath or more swath means lesser relatively less spatial resolution as in case of no IVHR data. Now, this uh, NOAA series I have been mentioning started with the uh, uh, TIROS N and later on it was named NOAA 6 and it continues 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 and uh, even 19, NOAA 18 and 19 are in operational. So, this in that way it is not a complete figure, but what, uh, what it is trying to tell that in tandem sometimes we had even 3 satellites. I mentioned which I am going to show you very soon the uh, satellite earth station of NOAA which we are having at IIT Roorkee uh, operational since 2002. We started cover at that time we had the data from NOAA 14, even NOAA 12 and uh, NOAA 11 and then continue the 15, 16 and uh, so on and so forth. Slowly, slowly these satellites completed their uh, sort of tenure or lifetime but new satellites have taken place and the current one are up to 19 they there is an after that uh, this NOAA series will stop working. So, NOAA 19 uh, was launched uh, in 2008 is still working is still acquiring the data it is a basically 5 channel data and uh, there are visible channel near infrared channel 3 infrared channel and then you are having 2 thermal infrared channel means uh, though they are working in a, a, in a passive one, but in night time they can also work that is that provides a good advantages. And this image of India and surrounding countries was acquired by our own earth station on 16 January 2003, uh, where very easily you can identify the fog belt, you can identify the Himalayan mountain, you can identify clouds and associated shadow and uh, many, many objects a very easily without even much processing of the remote sensing data. So, the, the swath is much larger 2800 kilometer wide swath compared to 9.6 kilometer swath in case of your uh, Carto set. So, this swath is very wide. So, you can 
recovery phenomena like a fog you can uh, look at that from how big area is being covered. But if you are having a small strip you cannot uh, imagine what kind of this phenomena exist. And uh, they, this is having a receiver and a external antenna which is a tracking antenna not a fixed one. It tracks the satellite depending uh, on where it is and uh, say 1.2 parabolic disk antenna and uh, it is controlled by a simple uh, PC personal computer it is having receiver and a software which uh, basically uh, having programmed or it gets the orbital parameters that when the data when the satellite will be overpassing over this area and then accordingly it will align wait for the data uh, which will come from the satellite and once the data start coming it will lock with the movement of the satellite and keep tracking that satellite uh, till it uh, disappears in other side of the horizon and that way it covers uh, acquires a image like in this case it has done. So, it might acquire uh, a satellite might be going a northbound or southbound. So, satellite suppose it is a northbound. So, the image uh, will start building up from the bottom means from the south and uh, till the uh, the satellite remain in the range of the antenna which is installed here. And uh, this is uh, this is showing the uh, you know the uh, footprint of a satellite. Footprint means here that uh, if satellite is overpassing like this, then still the station which is located here in IIT Roorkee can acquire the data. Even if it is passing over Roorkee, then it is uh, it will acquire a very long scene, long data. But if it is in oblique angle, this that means the antenna has to look the sideways, then the and the length of the data the, uh, the part of the strip is not going to be as long as overhead overpass means like when satellite is overpassing from almost center of this circle. So, it depends because the signal quality will reduces will reduce if it is passing uh, through uh, passing sideways, but uh, still it can acquire and as you can see that uh, sitting at uh, Roorkee uh, we, we could acquire the data or have been acquiring the data since October 2002 of all these uh, not only of India, but many surrounding countries which are falling under this circle. And uh, one goes sometimes if it is a uh, near overhead overpass uh, uh, seen then you can cover almost entire Himalaya which is more than 30 uh, you know about 3000 kilometer width and uh, you can cover in just one go. So, Brahmaputra is there, Ganga is there, Yamuna is there and all these uh, Mansarovar lakes and mountain peaks Everest or everything uh, was acquired just in one go. And uh, because of re having relatively poor spatial resolution, but having wide swath. So, there are a trade off, there are always advantages with having some sometimes relatively uh, low spatial resolution data. And uh, this is the data which is acquired in daytime and the same area was also covered uh, in night time through thermal channels looks like an x-ray of that thing. And uh, of course, it will provide it is recording the em uh, emittance which is coming out from the different objects which are present on the earth at that time. So, these images have to be interpreted analyzed in a completely different manner than the normal visible channel images and uh, that is a different thing. Now, uh, the last in this one are the radar satellites and I am going to cover the, the alive one which is the sentinel the data is free there are alive is a sentinel one is a two satellite constellation with prime objective of land and ocean monitoring and this mission is to provide the data in C band SAR data and it is a continu uh, continuity following the retirement of ERS 2 and NV set. Because these uh, ERS 1 a uh, ERS 1 and 2 were first launched and they completed their tenure then uh, NV set was there and uh, then a new series the sentinel started. So, it is a continuity of that data, but of course, after NV set and before sentinel there were some gap, but nevertheless now the data from sentinel. Uh, all these data from ERS, NVSET and Sentinel 
are having capabilities of interferometry. So, they are they which are having really very good use especially at uh, uh, to very accuracy and uh, covers uh, entire globe. Complete this satellite carry a CSAR sensor which offers medium and high resolution imaging in all weather conditions because radar remote sensing the atmospheric distortions, clouds, fog will not create any problem. So, they can acquire data in daytime, night time does not matter because the sensor itself will send the energy and that is reflected back and collected by the sensor. So, you do not have to depend on the external energy source like sun and so and see C, C are capable of obtaining night imagery as well as detecting a small movement on the ground which makes is useful for land and sea monitoring. This is small movement on the ground and uh, here the SAR interferometry is nowadays playing very very important role. Spacery movements, ground deformations causing by earthquake events, maybe landslides, maybe subsidence due to mining, maybe subsidence in long term due to over exploitation in of groundwater and so on and so forth. So, there this uh, SAR interferometry is playing very very important role. This is one example that how this SAR interferometry data from ALOS uh, which is a Japanese satellite and sensor Pulsar was used and uh, here the ground deformations of uh, uh, about 1 meter were measured which were induced by earthquake event which has occurred in uh, uh, 2015 in May 2015. And uh, there were another one so both of the locations of these epicenters are shown and these ground deformations in different colored fringes are also shown. So, this is how the SAR interferometry can basically measure very accurately and the ground deformation in a short time or in a long time which might have caused by maybe earthquake, maybe landslide, mining subsidence, maybe groundwater subsidence, over exploitation of groundwater and so on and so forth. So, this has become a very vital tool uh, to measure uh, ground deformations in long term as well in short term. So, this brings to the end of this different types of platforms in remote sensing. Thank you very much.